Hey, we're live. Hi, Kelly. Hi, Jamie. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you doing? Pretty good. Pretty good. Here we are for another live puppy training and behavior Q and A. Um, we only have like one day left before our little promotion around the essential puppy training course comes to an end. So we want to give everyone one last chance to get in there. Um, but yeah, how was, uh, how was your weekend? Did you get some good training in with the dogs? We trained, trained, trained. Sunday was big. Saturday was a big training day. It's always club day. So that was great. I had my two French ring dogs with me and two client dogs with me all day Saturday. And then yesterday was play and train gardening day. So more like teach the dogs how to chill out while you uh -huh. do other things, but be present and be part of the activity. So right. some settle down training or some go over there. Yeah, it's just kind of like, it's like passive active training, right? Because you, um, oh, hello, we have Daniela from Italy. Yes, again. Oh yeah, we, we have some, some people in the audience now. If you uh, uh, are just joining us, feel free to say hi and where you're from or what. So I think a lot of people don't realize that you know, even training your dog just to chill out and hang out. For most dogs, it's a skill that's learned and practiced over time. It's not that they just grow out of their energy levels or that, you know, that dogs will just hang. So, um, you know, it, it, it takes it takes some of the concentration away from what you're doing initially. Like I was trying to do some pruning and deadheading of my um, hydrangea, which is enormous. And, you know, I was able to do that, but I couldn't just put like two earbuds in and tune out. I had to have one earbud in and listen for what's going on because there are baby goats next door and, right. and less was mowing and, you know, there's a lot of activity. And so, you know, and I have a, I have a foster too, and he's, he's definitely learning how to, to just be he's a young german shepherd and he's available he's very cute but um you know he's learning he's learning the ropes and how to be just go hang out buddy dog too nice yeah we've got to um obviously we've been very excited about uh promoting the essential puppy training course but in the not too distant future i imagine we'll be releasing the settle series course oh, yes that's very very soon which we actually started before the essential puppy training course but then as puppies do, they took priority. Eve, yep. Eve was not going to stay a puppy forever. So, all well, right. Chris and Carrie Scotland. Hi, Carrie. Hi, Chris. Some familiar faces. Yeah, for sure. from abroad. Um, absolutely. I thought it said Orlando, Canada, which I suppose there could be Orlando, Canada. I know, I know it says Ontario, and yeah. well, but um, there we go. So I was um. I was on a camping trip this weekend with um, with a bunch of people from our my daughter's class, second grade class, including the family of Daisy from, <gasps> I don't know if any of the people watching, watched uh, the YouTube series we did, uh, <laughs> The Puppy Next Door, where I trained uh, my neighbor's puppy. Well, I helped them train, but I did a lot of good sessions with her. And um, we would have these training sessions and then we would review uh kelly would watch the 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 video and give me feedback and uh ian sometimes would as well ian's feedback sometimes meandered a little off topic but we appreciated the effort anyways but um she was along for the camping trip oh and, she came uh, yeah, yeah, dogs. This, this she trip? There. Oh, awesome. there were I actually was... a couple doggies and uh they were well behaved they were under close wraps though because there were coyotes around and uh, mm -hmm. Sunday morning at 6.30, we heard them making a racket. It's like my house all the time. And Daisy's a small dog. Um, if you haven't watched that that series, people out there, um, I think it's awesome. <laughs> Jamie, you did a, such a good job with Daisy, and you were pretty hilarious at times. And I, I enjoyed that more than I could have imagined. Um, it was fun to be able to critique as well. And it was really great because, you know, you, I mean, you, you certainly have learned a lot. Um, over the years listening and editing and attending different seminars and workshops and such and classes but you know to do it in situ is a whole other thing isn't it indeed yeah, yeah. it was a lot of fun and i'm looking forward to doing more training um you know uh i would like to see if i can get my hands on another puppy maybe see if we can find a puppy that uh that's crying in its crate or that it's an over eager biter because um eve who's the star of our essential puppy training course 
was uh, in some ways already too good at some things. She she never really cried a ton in her crate, and so we didn't really get to show the various troubleshooting steps. And uh, and as much as I wanted to, Kelly was not willing to to let yeah. us take her training backwards just for the pu purposes of uh, demonstrating it. But, you know, that is also because she came from a, a, a knowledgeable, excellent breeder who really set those puppies off on the right path from day one, um, who does follow all, a lot of our, if not all of our guidelines that we have in our breeders program and Dubar Academy. And uh, so it, it makes life so much easier if your puppy kind of already knows the ropes when they come into your new environment and without their litter mates. So, um, oh, let's see. So we have we have some questions coming already. I don't want them to to leave the all feed. Right. Sounds good. Um... The usual, but oh, the usual Australia and Wisconsin and BC, a lot of, a lot of people from all over the place. That's all. I love it. I love it. I love it. Yeah. If you have any questions, post them in the chat. And um, it's helpful if you mention your puppy's age, because of course that makes a huge difference. And uh, before we hop in the question, I'll just put this link up one time to let everyone know we are doing a launch sale for our essential puppy training course has over 170 demonstration videos where we go through every step of the process of training a puppy. I know it sounds like a lot, but it's all organized into five developmental stages. It's very clear what to do when, and um, you know that's that could take you six months to get through all the content. And uh, the nice thing is, you sign up today, take advantage of the launch sale, you'll get lifetime access. So you can start training now. You could even sign up now if you don't have a puppy, and you'd have access when you get your puppy. <laughs> Which I think is the best way to go. I, I wish there was a an easier way to get people to realize they're going to need help before they even get their puppy, so that they're set up, so that they are prepared and 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 have a, a strategy and you know the supplies and the time that they that they need. Yeah, that's what we're going to be doing in the next few months is figuring out how to reach those prospective puppy people, the people who are thinking about getting a puppy before they actually get it, and try and or the people who just got a puppy and don't realize that you know there's some some basic problems that are going to occur right. you know, or, or developmental deadlines and things anyway so we here's are... a good starter question yes uh p p cox says is there a certain age you should begin your training yes the right well i mean there's the the right time is now no matter what age <laughs> the right time is now or yesterday um so you know your puppy is um, the the earlier you begin, at least with some foundational stuff, the better. And it depends on what you mean by training. For most people, training I think means things like sit, come, you know, go lie down on your bed. And those, those things are skills that they can learn pretty much at any point in their life. Um, but the, the more important things are hitting the 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 husbandry and lifestyle and socialization skills early on, as early as possible. Um, I would say the most important things are to make sure that your puppy is practicing handling, um, handling such as learning how to have their paws wiped when it's wet and muddy or getting their nails clipped and being comfortable with that, uh, getting collar grabs so that they don't play games keep away or get defensive or frightened when you, when you need to reach for your puppy. Um, Learning how to where to go potty and you know and and when uh, learning how to be alone and to focus on appropriate chew toys uh, things like that are, are infinitely more important than than just teaching them you know sit down come and all that and honestly when they're babies that's that's not that's not the important thing it really is more about um, just training them to live with humans and to accept and enjoy all the things that we grabby starey you know. Vo over over vocalizing apes do in life so sooner the better um it's never too early you can start them when they start wiggling around on their little mats with when they're still with their moms you know with handling and, and stuff and so. yeah you were alluding to this a little with with eve about how for many people who are getting their dog their puppy from a breeder you know ideally some training, you know, some training begins at home with the breeder, whether that is, you know, a little bit of handling, desensitization to noises, smells, sounds, even some light, you know, potty training, just setting up the environment so that the puppies kind of naturally pick up some skills, you know, as young as four or five weeks old when they're little, tiny little, you know, 
yep. runs. Having, having a separate toilet area so they don't have to live in the area where they're where they're um, eliminating. Like you know, the youngest little worms, puppies, before they even can fully walk, will scoot scooch themselves away from their living area if you give them a space, you know, to enough space to designate a toilet area. So oh, it's like. Never- uh- Really. I'll follow up in terms of more information about where she's coming from. Uh, he says, I have a four month old uh, Border Collie Blue Gila Cross Rupert who is super smart and will only follow through on a command if he can see the treat, even fake peas to get treats. So certainly certainly four months old is plenty old for training, but I, I, I'm guessing you already knew that. Yeah, um, he, he, there's, you know, there is a, a sequence you know, definitely using rewards is a good way to go and using treats is a good way to go. Um, depending on how you utilize them at the beginning, it can be um, become a cue or um, an antecedent to the behavior, the, 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 the producing of the reward up front. So there is a training sequence that, um, that we follow that pretty much um, most professional trainers follow at this point that teaches you how to avoid uh, the lure becoming a bribe and um, and work through that. And we have plenty of plenty of information all over the Dunbar Academy about that as well. However, I would say at four months old, your puppy is still a puppy. I mean, maybe very smart and maybe has learned some things and fake peeing is, is kind of hilarious and frustrating at the same time. But, um, you know, they should be, they, they should be, still learning at that point. So I would, I would, I would definitely be still rewarding with tons of hand feeding and, and rewards and, and treats, but um, perhaps it's time to fade the, 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 the lore. And um, I would say we have so much information on that there. So it's about, you know, yeah, that's a big, that's a big project. It's, it, it's good to write, be appreciative of what you've got and that, you know, Hey, a four month old who is following through on commands in exchange for a treat, you're doing pretty good and you'll have time to phase out the treat and incorporate life rewards and you know which you should start right away at this point if you already feel you know and we do we do start that with eve don't we in our um puppy course of course we do and that's i mean that's one of the things i'm proudest about in the essential puppy training course is that we have it broken down into five stages so i think a lot of courses they'll show you a skill you know teach sit and they'll show you how to do it with a food treat but they don't show you how to phase out the food treat and how to start introducing distractions and how to start introducing distance. And we have multiple iterations of a lesson like that, you know, like recall mm-hmm. or sit, where we show you the next step. As your puppy gets the idea of the basics, you know, there's always that next step because you're always trying to improve reliability and reduce your need for tools like treats um, or leashes or, you know, what have you. You want to get to the point where your dog will just listen to your voice, ideally. And that does mean you never reinforce again, but it does mean you shouldn't have to show it to do it. And what I what I like about the, the course, one, one of the many things actually, is that um, this is Eve learning in real time. Like I did, we, we, we did this kind of in short, in quick succession. And so it's not like she was primed for the pump at, in, at every level. She, you are seeing her do um, the lessons in real time for the first time, every, every time. So did she, Work perfectly for no lure the first time I took the lure away from behaviors? No. But you see how we work through it and you and, and you see how, how important it is to, to do that and how yeah. quickly. I think can you can you are you looking at the right, so, uh, questions we have? Chris has just given us a little update. He's going to the cottage with Davey for the first time. Davey. Chris, we'd, yeah. we'd love to see some video of you practicing recalls with Daisy. So Davey, if you want to yeah. send it along. Such um, a big be happy to, to share it. Uh, yeah, that'd be great. I, I, I'm sorry, I'm a big Davy fan, so uh, I, I do want to see this. And you're going to a cottage, and you know, obviously there are going to be more. I mean, Chris knows this, but there are more distractions, wildlife, more open space, and potentially more danger in that sense. But um, yeah, I, I, I think um, important to have a plan, have your special treats with you. I mean, again, Chris, you know this, but maybe everybody else doesn't. Um, are you going to bring extra high value rewards for this extra? Um, novel and in, in distracting environment? That's a good question for Chris. Mm-hmm. Okay. okay, now who's next? So Carrie says, uh, how do I get two dogs to walk loose lead together? They both walk great separate. The puppy sometimes pulls. And again, it'd be nice to know how old the puppy is, uh, but it's getting there. How do they understand that outside on a lead is not playtime and they have to walk nicely? 
It's a good question. And, you know, I always tell people that, um, you know, if you have two dogs, it's actually like having three, at least especially initially upon the acquisition of the second dog, uh, because they do need to work independently and then also learn how to work together. And that is a skill and it doesn't, you know, dogs are very contextual. Um, the extra excitement and uh, distraction of having their buddy around uh, is, is more challenging, not to mention they're feeding off of each other and maybe their different energies and habits. So everybody who have two dogs, you definitely train them one-on-one -on -one, and then you practice together. And this is, we, we talked about this in our last uh, live a little bit, but basically humans go too, too quickly. Too, they jump steps really, really quickly. So if you want them to walk right on a lead together, you actually should practice that before you go on a walk. And you should practice that in the house and you should practice that in your hallways and in your driveway and in your garden or backyard or just in front of your house on the street, just going back and forth and get them used to the skill and and with I would say a high rate of reinforcement um, and <laughs> it's hard at first because like maybe one's doing something right the other one's not doing something quite right but you can um, take it step by step you can go back to sit you know one step let's go so everybody sit good dogs feed 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 look at me good dogs let's go one or two steps sit oh good dogs and kind of start building on that so they get the idea that they should stay near you and that sitting they should be looking for that opportunity to sit for the reward it's one one way there's a lot of different things we can do there but i would practice if you if you if they are good at walking on leash independently it means you've done something right and you know how to do this so now you have to just not take them out in the big wide world together and think that it's gonna it's gonna you're gonna have the same results as when they're alone so break it down smaller and start um in easier environments that's the quick tip Oh, just a little heads up. The, the, the puppy's nearly two, but has spent many, many months crate rested as she tore her cruciate oh, in six months. Oh, and was too young for surgery, so her training is behind. Yep, okay. that ha life happens. It certainly, certainly can get in the way. Um, oh, well, and it's hydrotherapy. So she she's doing it for walks now. Yeah. Yay. I love hydrotherapy. And, uh, and Chris updated us with the high value treats he's bringing, including. Roast beef, smoked salmon, uh, cheese, favorite toys, and some rough housing, which Davey loves so much, which is, of course, essential. Not just high-value food, but high-value activities. That, that, are, that are, yeah, activities that magnetize your dog to you. You've got to be interesting. So, Chris, I knew, I knew Chris would be prepared. But um, the thing is, like, you want to go to the cabin. You want to go out in the woods. You want to do your thing. And your dog will be your companion in these, in these adventures. But not without putting the work in up front. You know, you don't just automatically take you know, your dog to the to the cabin for the first season and, and expect that they're going to behave that the way you know they, they do at home. So, um, you know, Davy is new to the family, has many many years of cabin going to come. So this is the year to work on it, and so eventually you can kick back. That said, if training is fun. Why would you ever stop? You know. Uh, training, fun recall practice. I mean, people always want to stop with the rewarding. When can I stop giving them food? When can I stop rewarding? Well, why? I mean, why are right. you so When's your boss going to stop paying you? You know, I mean, it, you shouldn't, it shouldn't be a, um, necessarily one for one for the rest of their lives, you know, but you do have to build in the behavior bank. You know, when, you're, when you get a new dog, they have, whether it's a puppy or a dog that's just new to you, even if they have already have some skills with somebody else, when you get a new dog, they are behaviorally bankrupt. Your relationship is behaviorally bankrupt, you know? And so you've got to invest. You've got to put money in that account before you can start withdrawing without having to put money right back in, right? If you just started your savings account and you have $10 in there and you do, then you take $10 out at an ATM or take a dollar out every time you go for a toll, you know, that's only going to work for a little while. You know, you've got to, Put more money in there. And someday, if you've saved a lot, when you've got $500,000 in there, you know, maybe you don't worry so much about a few coffees or tolls, you know, but you know, you, you, you do have to continue to invest. So putting money in the bank is praising and rewarding and taking money out of the bank is asking your dog to do something. 
Yeah, yeah, basically, you know, without rewarding. You're withdrawing every time you're, you're withdrawing and, and lessening the value every time you do something without reinforcement. And most yeah. people do some little reinforcement up front and then figure that they've got some kind of lifetime, you know, magic magic behavior bank account that just keeps, you know. Oh, magic bank accounts, the best type. I wish, right? So you do have to invest, otherwise things will be yeah. And you're yeah. So, so. Right, here's a, here's a good question. Avery gets a gold star. They uh, they included a age with their question. So, hi, do you have any tips for an eight week old puppy that is not motivated by kibble? She receives all of her food in Kongs and by hand feeding, but not, does not seem motivated to chew on her Kongs. Thanks. Okay, so at eight weeks of age, it's a good question and, and a pretty typical thing. Um, your, your puppy probably is interested in kibble enough to to eat um, at some point because um, you know. Uh, she's thriving, and uh, I don't mean to be facetious there, but they do. They all will eat. They all will eat. At, at eight weeks old, they, they're young. They're babies. So as much as we do want them to learn to love their kongs, um, and uh, a couple of things could be happening here. It's 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 brand new. It takes a little while for them to adjust to this feeding system. Another thing is um, maybe the kong stuffing is too hard. I don't know if you're just putting loose kibble in there and letting it roll around, or if you're packing it, you know, and making a nice stuffed kong like some of our our recipes on our YouTube um, video. What's that called? Kelly's Canine Kitchen. Kelly's Canine <laughs> Kitchen. Um, Which is, you know, I mean, by you know, the way, still our number one YouTube video. Well done, Kelly. It was, it was fun to make. Um, so you you know you don't want to make it, it, it too challenging at first. Like with Eve in the uh, essential puppy training course, we literally just started with loose kibble and a couple smelly, extra smelly treats like in the bottom, so that she was really into it. And we also did absolutely supplement feeding with hand feeding because we were training a lot, right? Every time she went potty, uh, little baby puppy recalls and games. Um, you can also try a puzzle toys easy puzzle toys for right now um i would basically just use loose kibble and a kong and you can the, sit with um, your puppy and learn to not nudge it around and stuff as well the planet dog <laughs> snoop is a really nice one for puppies it, it uh it releases kibble a little easier for a beginner so that's a, a good one to try yeah so i mean you shouldn't be making sticky pastes or anything yet um, although you could to get your puppy used to the idea of licking into the kong um put a little bit of yogurt or cheese or you know some peanut butter or something sticky inside the kong um i don't love the idea of peanut butter kongs in the big picture but something to teach them okay lie down and lick in there but only around the edges on the top because they're not going to be able to get to the rest so your puppy might be getting a little frustrated and bored uh your puppy's probably also getting enough food in the day um you can also enhance your kibble. You want to talk about that, Jamie? You're a good kibble enhancer. Oh, yeah. I mean, like, so <laughs> dogs are so dependent on smell that a little bit of something that smells extra tasty can make all the difference. So yep. one of the best yep. crumbleable, stinky things that dogs love is a little freeze-dried liver. And uh, we have a brand, I think it's called Grumps Naturals, mini trainers, tiny little cubes. So you can just <laughs> take a couple of those, crumble them up into a bag of kibble and kind of shake it up uh and it's kind of like the dorito cheese dust for a dog that uh that bumps it up to the next level and now they smell the liver and so they get way more excited about it and you know if you have a kong all it takes is just one little you know crumbled up freeze-dried liver in there and now it's not just kibble it's enhanced kibble so but i should also say avery if you've got an eight week old puppy you should probably sign up for the uh, essential puppy training course. We have a uh, we have the fifty percent off sale, and of course, we always have a thirty day satisfaction guarantee. So you could watch it all in the next thirty days and see if you like it. Keep it if you like it, and if you don't, you could let us know. We'll give you a refund. But uh, pretty sure that once you see um, all the amazing content, you will be pretty excited to hold on to it. Because yeah, it's the perfect time to start. I mean, literally, literally the perfect time to start. Eve was nine weeks old when we started filming that. Mm -hmm. So uh, the ki kinologist has a question, which I don't know that we can answer here, but um, I think Ian might answer it in his sexual behavior uh, seminar on Dunbar Academy. So you might want to check that, but I don't know if you have any anything to add here, Kelly. When a puppy yeah, is really neutered so. prior to reproductive maturation, especially those that have the procedure prior to 16 weeks, is there any studies or your experience that speaks to how much it affects him? 
Oh, there's tons of studies. Um, I don't have them off the top of my head, but yes, and, and it affects them in many, many ways. Um, uh, physiologically, there are tremendous um, benefits to waiting. I am not a doctor, nor do I play one on TV or on this platform, but um, yes, it's, 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 your know, sexual hormones are, are a part of your whole hormone you know, palate and, and you, and you need them. They're there for a reason. So behaviorally, physiologically, there are, um, consequences to early, um, alter, altering, alteration. Yeah. Ian, so uh, Ian does have a whole seminar on that and he is the master of sex and aggression in dogs and another, another, <laughs> animal, well, well, just, the master of sex and aggression. Uh, okay. <laughs> dogs. No, I'm um, no in sex in sexual behavior in, in not just dogs actually, but that, I mean, he literally, that was his specialty in his postdoc work. Um, so yeah, it's a six, it's, a six hour seminar. It's part of the Top Dog Academy. So you can join the Top Dog Academy to get access to it, or you can buy it a la carte. Um, but it is fascinating. There is a bunch of stuff there that, like, I, I did not know that I was going to be intrigued, but I was very intrigued. They didn't know you needed to know. Um, I, was, but, I, I, I was there to film that one. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good one. It's okay. One so, um, it's actually, um, that's how I met Ian, it was at a, a sex and aggression workshop that he did. Huh. like 25 years ago huh. all right sue says hi i live across a valley from a shooting range and hear the gunshots how can i prevent a new pup from becoming sensitive to the noise or any loud noises um you will be it's probably a good thing that that's there because your puppy and it sounds like it's, if it's across the valley it's far enough that it, i mean you'll the dog will hear the noises, but they won't be so alarmingly loud. Um, we have gunshot all around here too, and a, a shooting range nearby. Um, they'll probably just acclimate fine. What you'll want to do is watch. You know, if there's a day like here, we know that with the uh, the, sh the shooting range over here, I say shooting gallery, shooting range over here, like weekends are busier, things like that. So, you know, um, it can be very quiet during the day. If you know there are times when it's busy and you're going to hear the noises, or if you do notice the noises, go hang out with the puppy, do some hand feeding and some playing. Don't make a big deal. Don't even acknowledge the, the, the gunshot if the puppy isn't. And, um, but do do a whole jolly routine and, and just do, do a bunch of classical conditioning around the noises. Um, most likely, if it's slightly in the distance like that and happening from day one and on, from the get-go, your pup will probably be okay with it. But do watch for sound sensitivity. Um, certain breeds are more prone to that. But then again, you know, it can happen to, with any dog. Um, and many dogs are just fine. So the very fact that you're concerned about it and aware of it means you're probably going to be okay. But if, if you do know there are high-volume times where this is going to happen in you know, quick succession. Get out your special toys and your special treats and your Kongs and, and stuff and hang out with your puppy and be there to observe them and make sure that they, you know, that they're comfortable and distracted. It's, it's a good opportunity for classical conditioning. And then just desensitization, you know, um, you know, so. Right. You can find, um, you know, YouTube playlists and, uh, and phone mm -hmm. apps with all sorts of different sounds that you can play for your pup um to desensitize them get used to them and the nice thing about those is is you can control the volume and you can control when the noise happens um so you know it's not going to get out of control it's not going to be traumatizing yeah. obviously the, the caveat is with a lot of things like like gunshots or with um lightning and thunder you know it's not just the sound and mm -hmm. so sound is part of it and so it's well worth you know like play some thunder sounds for your pup and get them totally used to that that'll help but when real thunder happens there's you know the environment changes in ways and and when real gunshots happen like depending on how close they are you might actually feel the reverberations in a way that exactly. you're not, you're not exactly. gonna have with a, an iphone but it, it doesn't hurt you know to to play sound all sorts of different sounds construction noises and you know uh sports arena cheering and and what have you just play Maybe it all. Yeah. Babies crying are really, you know, so, so it is good to do some do some audio desensitization early on um, in general, as Jamie said. But it is more than that. The storms and the guns, they have, you know, there's a pressure change with storms. There's definitely feeling that goes along with, with gunshot if it's close enough. 
Um, so let us know how it goes. It should be fine, but it's good that you're thinking about it. All right. Uh, Caroline, uh, currently walking a male staffy, three years old. Not not quite a puppy, but um, great focus in the garden, home, but will fixate on dogs and anxious in, oh, anxious in where? Hmm. I guess the question is about, um, is about f fixing up, fixating on dogs, uh, and you know, I guess how to how to keep your dog's attention on walks. Let's see if I see anything else down below. I don't see anything. Uh, yeah, that's um, you know, I mean, that's that's staffy behavior. That's pit bull behavior. To, you know, like fixating on dogs is very very normal for them. Um, it means you're going to have to be mindful, and you do absolutely want to teach them to um, turn away and look at you as much as possible. I, I'm training a, an adult people right now for somebody and she grew up kind of um, out in the wilds out in the country and you know got to fix it and whatever she wanted for years she's a little bit older and you know it's a process but you, you do start at um, a distance uh, a couple tips do it's easier to do while you're stationary than when you're moving it's e easier to do if the other dog is stationary and not moving or at least not walking by um to do these kind of these kind of exercises so you can set this up with a friend if possible you know meaning that you have control over when the dogs are moving and what the proximity is i would absolutely set up some of these exercises i'll tell you what the exercises are in a minute um and when you are on walks you know trying to keep the the distance you know, trying to, proximity does matter so when you when you are, are on a walk you can't control the other dogs that are coming towards you, um, hopefully unleashed, go to places where these dogs are under control, and work on your classical conditioning, which also will help you start to get an operating. So basically, um, this is, I would say, hand feed the dog exclusively on these kind of walks around animals, uh, especially if you can get some setup sessions first to, to get some practice under your belt, and let them know, this is for a few days, a few days or a week or two, um, get the idea that you see the other dog, and we feed, but you have to be at a distance where the dog can take food. And that could be a lot of distance or, you know, it could be 20 feet. It could be 100 feet. And you just work progressively towards getting closer. That's your classical conditioning side to it. You want to change their emotions to warm and fuzzy rather than aroused and excited or anxious. And what they start to do operantly usually is then they, once they're feeling a little bit more relaxed, they're in a place where they can learn. They see this thing, they start to get those feelings, and they know, oh, when I get this feeling, I look I look to you for support. And that, then you can, yay, you can mark it. Good dog, touch, come here, feed, feed, feed. And um, one mistake people make is to ask for too much too soon. Don't ask your dog to do anything. They don't have to watch. They don't have to touch at first. If they turn to you, celebrate, keep, and, and then have a long protracted celebration. And once this becomes the norm, then you can add things like a hand touch or a sit or an eye contact. But don't ask for too much too soon. Just be happy if they even give you a, a lip lick and a quick glance. Yeah, notice, you know, and um, you can change their um, their emotional response to to the stimuli. Um, and then you can decrease the the distance. But you're probably always going to have to be somewhat vigilant if this dog is, you know, that actively focused and targeting on dogs. So. All right. The quick answer. The quick. Yeah. There's more to it, but. So WD Fong says, hi, any advice on knowing when is the best time to add a new puppy to a home that already has a dog? We have a four-year-old who has done serious puppy K, puppy one and puppy two, and uh, is pretty well-trained, uh, still needs a little bit of work, gets uh, excited, a little leash reactive, but they wanna get a new puppy and they wanna know when's the best time in terms of respecting the age difference and Really making sure the puppy doesn't learn bad habits from the current dog. Um, well, uh, those are two different but very important things to consider: age in general of, of the, the adult dog, but also the bad habits part. You know, if you're ready for a new dog or a second dog, when you feel like your um, your adult or existing dog is no longer um, requiring management and training and high volume on the walks. It doesn't mean you won't reward them sometimes. It doesn't mean you won't practice and warm up and, and have fun and play and train your dog. But if you feel like you're still in the process of fixing something, then it is not the right time. Um, however, age-wise, uh, I would say a two to 
to three or four year age difference, you know, between dogs is a, is, is a good time to do it. You don't want to wait too long um, because your older dog might get more, you know, um, set in their ways and grumpy and not wanting another dog around. On that note, make sure that your dog wants another dog. You know, just try to spend some time with some other puppies around or consider whether your dog actually wants and needs a friend. Um, some dogs do, some dogs don't. But to me, the, the magical age, and this, I mean, it's a generalization. It really does depend on the scenario, but is, I, li I like my dogs um, like three, three to four years apart usually, ideally. So you're timing wise, you're ready. Um, it depends on what you're working on behaviorally, and and you know if you have the reactivity, you, don't, you certainly don't want to add um, walking. You know, in six months to a year's time, you don't want to walk another adolescent dog with your adult dog that is not going to learn to be reactive, and, and they're going to feed off of each other. So, either be prepared to walk them separately for a long time, or maybe get that a little more solidly under wraps, you know, depending on how extreme it is. All right, and actually, on a similar note, Kelly says, <laughs> Kelly Whittington. How can I encourage a positive relationship between my new puppy, 10 weeks old, and my three senior dogs? The only way the puppy wants to interact with them is by biting them hard. So they want nothing yeah. to do with her. That seems pretty reasonable. Yeah, I mean, 10 week old puppies are bitey and older dogs don't appreciate that kind of thing. Um, it's important that um, the do older dogs get time without the puppy. Um, can you know can still get their freedom and their downtimes? The good news is little puppies at that age require a lot of um, supervision and management. So, X pens, leashes, um, you know, downtime in their crate. So your your older dog should still get plenty of opportunity to to have a rest. Um, it's okay to intervene. I don't know how old your senior dogs are, or if they're also maybe a smaller breed and now you have a, a larger breed puppy or what the exact dynamics are but you you don't you know if, if a dog is, is older and and safe to do so i do let them correct puppies a bit and let them handle that to a degree themselves but i always also like keep keep those sessions short so you don't want your puppy to just be allowed to harass the older dogs you know indefinitely so i would give them 10 minutes together at a time 20 minutes together here and there and um you can keep the puppy on a line if you need to um so, 12, 14 and 15 years old wow you know, those are older dogs so they don't they don't need puppy time so much i would focus on um exhausting your puppy <laughs> and, and, and making sure that they're they're in a quiet space when they're hanging out with their older older siblings and or keep them on a leash or a line so that you can redirect the puppy and um, teach them that like two times in the evening are a good time to do this, right? They'll make sure the puppy's gotten out for play times, potty times, training times, a little field trip. And then when it's time to chill out after dinner calls, it's like, like come on, let's all sit down together. I'm gonna sit on the floor with you. The old dogs can be wherever they like to be. And we're gonna sit with a leash on if necessary and your chew toy. And you're just gonna sit here on my lap or next to me on the floor and on, or on your bed. And you're gonna learn how to hang out. And uh, we're gonna do Netflix and chew times. And uh, we do that and puppy may only earn five to 10 minutes of that at first. You know, um, maybe an hour if they're really good. Uh, maybe they fall asleep. But they're they're supervised and or managed to the point where they can't harass, and that's a good place to start because then they're learning that the presence of the older dogs isn't exciting, biting, and chewing time. It's it's chill times. Um, but you're you at that with that household, I would absolutely be managing that more than I would be letting it go, and um, not letting the the seniors get harassed. All right. Um, Dan says, hi, thanks for your very helpful videos. My 14 weeks old uh, golden retriever just won't sleep in his crate. So he's now sleeping in several spots in the house. I still want to try the crate. Any advice? Well, I mean, I'm assuming that means that at 14 weeks, the puppy's crying in the crate. I uh, don't know uh, where the puppy is, where the crate is, but it sounds like maybe I don't know if you're using the crate during the day either. I might start with during the day, making sure the puppy has a little bit of alone time in the crate. But you don't start alone. You start by sitting with the puppy. We have lots of videos on this too in the um, Essential Puppy Training course, right? Getting, although Eve wasn't really hard to get used to her crate. Um, and you did this with Daisy too, didn't you, on the YouTube series? You know, like yeah. you sit with the puppy, right? 
Yeah, you know, I mean, actively training your puppy to like going into their crate and staying in their crate, just using their daily allotment of food. And it's it couldn't be simpler. I, we actually had um another family friend get a puppy recently, and they brought it over. And they haven't, <laughs> haven't been doing a great job at, at uh, following the lesson. But they, they were saying as well, their puppy didn't want to go in the crate. And um, so, you know, we were having dinner and stuff. But after a little while, I was like, all right, I'll do some training with it. And just sat down next to the crate, handful of kibble. Showed the puppy the kibble, tossed in the crate, um, you know, did that for five minutes. And then they came over and they were shocked because the puppy was just lying down happily in the crate because that <laughs> puppy just had the last, you know, 20 snacks. And it was dead simple, too. The, their, um, their little son was over, too. And I showed him how to do it. And it's like, this is one of those things that you can totally outsource to, to little kids. Yeah. You know, so, they just throw uh, a piece of kibble in the crate. And it was simple because also you weren't asking for too much too soon. Um, you know, it sounds like this, you know, at 14 weeks, this puppy is already kind of somehow managed in their house without, hopefully without too much problem or accidents or chewing or, or, or destruction. But, um, you know, you, you can, you can do 30 seconds at a time. You can play crate games where they just go in the crate and you throw the good high value food inside and then let them out and then have them go back in. And it's not always like you're going to be put away. It's like, just, this is a game. You get your crate. Like it's like, touching home base, you know, and getting rewarded, and then you start over, um, or you sit next to them when they're tired, and you stick your fingers through the crate, you know, door, and you tickle their nose, and talk to them while they chew, and it's definitely worth taking the time to acclimate them if, if you're having some struggles. I might also, depending on where your crate is, move it. Um, if they don't like being in the crate of night, where is the crate? Is it far from you? Can you put it next to your bed for a few days, and then move it outside your bedroom door, and then move it down the hall? So that, you know, maybe the puppy just really doesn't want to be alone. And, you know, it's a baby. They don't, you know, they have to learn how to be alone. It's normal and natural for them to be, um, vo to vocalize and be stressed out when they're on their own. They're babies. They should never be alone in, in, in theory, you know? Yeah. Right. And I think a lot of people, right, they they get stuck that it's either like a kind of a cry it out mi mindset or mm -hmm. a no crate. And you can... Your puppy's upset you can calmly comfort them but what you want to remember is when they do settle down you also want to reinforce that and that like if you don't pay any attention to them when they're actually napping and quietly doing what you want you're not reinforcing that good behavior and so when they do settle that's down, wanna... that scares people they don't want to wake up the puppy right <laughs> but a good tired puppy like we we did this with uh well, i don't remember if it was eve or daisy but i definitely remember you know like she'd fall asleep and i'd go up and be like thank you. Like, this is perfect. This is what you, just what you want. And she'd look up, you know, be like, oh, you're there. And then she'd just go back to sleep because she's tired, you know? Um, yeah. I wanted to uh, shout this out as well, Kelly. I think you coined a new a new phrase. Netflix and chew. Netflix and chew. Uh -huh. It's totally a thing in our house. I mean, you know, I've got puppies coming and going. I raise puppies for people and I raise plenty for myself. And uh, and it's something we keep up. It's, a, it's like they they look they look forward to it. Era is my two and a half year old Malawa, and she knows that you know. Yes, sometimes we do eat in front of the TV. And, you know, so we'll have, we'll finish our meal, and they are in their on their beds. And she knows that when the plates are cleared, she she gets up and she is like, okay, okay, it's Netflix and chew time. Mm -hmm. So everybody should teach their dog to Netflix and chew. Yeah, I mean, right, learning to chill out on cue is such an unessential but underappreciated skill for dogs. Um, and it's not relaxing at first. This is, again, this is where humans get, I think, too um, impatient. Like, it's something you teach. Just like I started talking about earlier at the beginning of this session where it's like the gardening and, and chilling. That doesn't just happen naturally necessarily when they're young and energetic. So um, it means sometimes getting up off the couch, pausing your show and putting them back on their bed or finding the chew toy that they knocked under the couch, you know, and getting it out for them or, you know, what are, you know, whatever it may be getting up. If they get up and wandering off, you're going to have to get up to and make sure they don't wander off because they might be going off, wandering off to go potty or find something to chew on that is not the chew you provided. So, you know, it's not a hundred percent relaxing at first, but it's so worth it because it will be relaxing and they're, and they're going to be trust friendly in the long run. Yeah. Let's see. Emily pointed out uh, we've got fireworks on YouTube or Alexa when sleeping. So I think going back to that gun uh, gun range question and Sophia also has a shooting range nearby. 
dogs got used to it, but she, you know, made the special effort to give Kongs and did fun stuff when the gunshots happened. So, you know, she even, the dogs had a positive association. Yeah, I wouldn't just take it for granted. And and there are some breeds, again, that are particularly sound sensitive. If you have like a border collie type, there's more likely that they're going to sensitize to it. The thing is, if it's happening all the time, as long as the first few times they're not too startled and they have a positive association, there's a good chance they're going to learn that that's, you know, the the background noise of your environment. So, but, but I wouldn't take it for granted. I would absolutely try to make it a fun experience for the first few times at least. All right. And this is WD Fong. I think is is Wendy, I'm not sure. Uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, but, um, and this was, uh, she was initially asking about, right, when's the right time to get a puppy? And there's a little more insight into the situation. What to do when a young puppy that previously played well with other dogs and pups starts to behave in an inappropriately aggressive manner towards other dogs or pups at four to five months old, running up and biting hard, attacking, being a bully, that sort of behavior. Uh, that's kind of a longer question, um, and it would, I'd have to see what exactly is going on, but I would absolutely manage that and not allow would be the short answer. Um, not all dogs are going to make good, good dog park or do, good dog friends. You know, I have several dogs of my own, and they don't all play. Some of them do, and there's one in particular that nobody enjoys, who shall remain nameless um for their own protection and um that dog plays with me and plays with other people and we do parallel walks and we do chew times but we don't do play times so nobody wants to play with that dog you know um and she tends to get over aroused too too soon too easily and it's it's would be practicing bad things so um it depends it really does depend but i would i would manage that 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 adolescent a burgeoning adolescent or tween with a line um for sure with um timeouts for for bad behavior and redirection to human-centric games around dogs for some co-playing you know if you can get that dog to play with you around other dogs you now have a tool that you can use to call them out of play and and you know redirect them or calm them down often also just keeping things super 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 short because this is a young a young dog get it four ish months. Do you say four months? Is that four to six? Yeah, months? four to five months old. So at that point, you know, you still have an opportunity to sway the behavior a little bit. So um, never let things escalate. Little training breaks. This is what we do in our series puppy classes, um, which you can also see on the Dunbar Academy, um, which is not letting just play go. It's not, you know, I mean, Arousal goes up and up and up and up and up when, when when dogs are playing and it can get out of control and then you know before you know it someone's crying it's like kids at the park right so don't let it just you know continue to rise in energy keep making breaks do you do that with the kids Jamie do you do that with human kids too you take yeah, breaks for sure. we have a uh, we have a slide in the backyard that I built out of cardboard crazy oh and it's in it's in the course isn't it uh yeah I think there's I think it appears once or twice but like. You put the kids on there and it's big enough that they're all just kind of rough housing on it. And mm -hmm. usually what we'll do is be like, all right, slides closed for five minutes. You know, everyone go find something else to do. And mm -hmm. it brings the, the um, you know, brings the energy down and lets people reset. Um, the other thing I do is I go and I'll ask, like, is everybody here having a good time? And if everyone says yes, then all right, we keep playing. Um, obviously, you can't uh, verbally ask that to your dogs as easily. but um, I think one thing you know you talked about in the course when we were introducing when we weren't introducing when we were showing how to manage play between Eve <laughs> and her older sister Villa. Eve was kind of a punk for a little while uh, with her play style, and uh -huh. and uh, we talked about how one of the ways you can check to see if dogs are having a good time playing together is you restrain one of the dogs and you put one dog on leash. And you restrain the bully for the most part. Right, right. you restrain the, the bully. That's that is a good the point. Eve is the bully. Right. And yes. you see what the other dog does, because sometimes what looks like, you know, aggressive, unfriendly behavior is actually everyone's enjoying it. You know, if the other dog comes over and and is like, hey, what what's what's wrong? Aren't you playing? Then, you know, they were they were probably having a good time. Yeah, it's it's helpful. It's helpful. Sometimes it's not clear. Like, is this play or is this tipping? And so that's a good way to, to check. Yeah. All right. Well, we hit the bottom of our list of questions. Uh, I think we're going to call it a day, but we really enjoyed uh, talking with you all. 
And we're actually going to be doing um, another Q&A next week, but it's going to be for students who are enrolled in the Essential Puppy Training course. Um, and we're going to do another one the following week, but we're really trying to uh, make sure that the, the course is very comprehensive. So we're looking for, you know, students who, who have been reviewing the material, but still have questions. You know, it wasn't, wasn't initially obvious in the course so that we can fill out the course with, with frequently asked questions. And we're actually also looking for people um, who are having trouble with their puppies and are interested in a little more support and maybe would be interested in filming themselves and their puppies, whatever problems they're having, so that we can see what's going on, provide um, provide more directed feedback, but then also you know, use that to fill out the course with uh, some troubleshooting cases. So if uh, that sounds like anyone you know, anyone with a puppy who's you know struggling with the crate training, I think we maybe heard one of those questions here, struggling with bite inhibition, struggling with whatever, yeah. let sure. us know. Yeah, let us know and um, we can we can help you out. Because, yeah, yeah, I would love to do that. I would love to get some like real life feedback going on this course right now. We had so much fun doing it, making it, and he was a star in many ways. Um, but um, that left us, that left us with some some holes. I want I want to see some crying puppies that we can fix. Uh -huh. <laughs> right. All right. Well, that's terrible. You. Oh, Bam. and it's a foster pup that Wendy has. Yeah. Oh, I want to hear more about that on the on the top dogs. All right. Don't lose your dog, Chris. Don't lose your dog. <laughs> yeah, Chris, Chris, go to the, the cottage. All right. Well, thanks everyone for joining us. We'll see you next time. Good and, night. Uh, take care. Bye bye. -bye. bye, -bye.